In this lecture, we're going to look at the oxidation states of transition metals and indeed other elements as well. By the end of this lecture, you should be able to work out the oxidation number of an element in simple compounds and in polyatomic species. You should also be able to recognise oxidation and reduction reactions by looking at the change in a species oxidation number. And finally, you should be able to understand that transition metals can often exist in a range of oxidation states and can comment on their relative stability. During this lecture, I will switch between the terms oxidation states and the oxidation numbers. The, the terms are interchangeable and so don't worry about whether I say one or the other. Now, most transition metals can exist in a variety of oxidation states, although this feature is not unique to transition metals, and as we'll see, it does happen to other elements as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain the rules you have to follow in order to determine the oxidation state or oxidation number of an element. So the first rule we're going to use is that the oxidation state of an element is zero. So for example, if you have magnesium, just magnesium metal, then the oxidation state of magnesium is zero. If you have chlorine, the oxidation state of the chlorine is zero. If you've got helium, its oxidation state is going to be zero. So the oxidation number of an element is zero. The second rule is that for ions, the oxidation number is the same as the charge for the ion. So for example, if we had calcium oxide, the charge on the calcium ion is 2 plus, and the charge on the oxygen ion is 2 minus. So we say that calcium has got an oxidation number of plus 2. Note this is slightly confusing. When you're writing the charge, you put 2 plus. But in the oxidation state, you have to put plus 2. You don't get the mark if you put 2 plus. And the oxidation number of the oxygen is minus 2, not 2 minus. Or to do another example, for example, uh, sodium sulfide. The oxidation state of the sodium is plus one, because the sodium ions have got a charge of one plus, and the sulphur has got a charge of two minus, so it's got an oxidation state of minus two. Third rule is that in most compounds, hydrogen will have an oxidation state of plus one. The fourth rule, that in most compounds, oxygen has an oxidation number of minus two, as in some of the previous examples. But there's one common exception to this rule, and that is when you have peroxides, like hydrogen peroxide. So in, that, the, in, that, in those circumstances, the oxidation number of the oxygen is minus one. And the final rule is that the sum of all the oxidation numbers in a molecule or a polyatomic ion must equal the overall charge. Okay, so let's uh, have a look at some examples. So, what is the oxidation number of carbon in a carbonate ion, CO3 2 minus, or as in carbon monoxide? CO3 2 minus. Okay. So we don't know what the oxidation state is of the carbon, but we know the oxygen is minus two. There's three of them, so that gives us a total charge of six minus. Okay. 
the overall thing has got a charge of 2 minus, so the carbon's got to be plus 4. So the overall charge is 2 minus, or minus 2, and you get minus 6 from the 3 oxygens plus your carbon. So the carbon has got to be plus 4. So in carbonate, the oxidation number of the carbon is plus 4. In carbon monoxide, however, the overall thing is neutral. The oxygen is minus 2, so the carbon must be equal to plus 2. So in carbon monoxide, uh, the carbon has got an oxidation state of plus 2. Okay, now I'd like you to try and do these two yourself. What is the oxidation number of sulphur in A, the sulphate ion, and B, in sulphur dioxide, SO2? So, pause the tape, try it for yourself, and then we'll go over the answers. Okay, so, in the sulphate ion, doesn't show up very well. So SO42 minus. The overall charge is minus two. We've got four oxygens, each being minus two. So that comes to minus eight plus the sulfur. So the sulfur must equal plus six. So the oxidation state of the sulfur in the sulfate ion is plus six. In sulphur dioxide, however, the overall charge is neutral. And you've got two oxygens, each minus two, so you've got minus four plus the sulphur, so the sulphur must be plus four. Okay. So there's a couple of examples in which elements other than transition metals have got variable oxidation states. Oxidation numbers can also be used to determine whether or not the reaction is an oxidation or reduction reaction. Let's look at a couple of examples. So here we see the chromium 3 plus ion being changed into the dichromate ion Cr2O72 minus. So by looking at the oxidation states, we can tell here whether or not the chromium has been oxidized or reduced. So Chromium 3 plus has the oxidation number of plus 3. And then the dichromate, the overall charge is 2 minus. It's got 7 oxygens, so that's 14 minuses. So the chromines must come to plus 12. There's two of them, so each chromine must be plus 6. So you see the oxidation number has increased. So that means that this is an oxidation reaction. So because it's Increase tells you that it's oxidation. In the second example, we see the permanganate ion changing to the Mn2 plus ion, a reaction which often happens in redox reactions. So permanganate has got an overall charge of 1 minus, so 4 oxygens, so that's 8 minus. So the manganese must be plus 7. And Mn2 plus, and the oxidation number, it's just the same as the charge, which is plus 2. So the oxidation number has reduced, so it's a reduction reaction, okay, which is where the word reduction reaction comes from. So a decrease in the oxidation number, or a reduction in the oxidation number, corresponds to a reduction reaction. So sometimes you'll just be expected to identify oxidation and reduction reactions by looking at the change, if any, that's occurred in the oxidation number. Finally, we're going to have a look again at the variable oxidation states of all the transition metals. Now, 
A very common oxidation state for the transition metals is the plus two oxidation state brought about by the loss of the two 4s orbitals. So very often we get copper two plus, nickel two plus, uh, etc. However, in iron we actually find that the Fe3 plus is more common than Fe2 plus. And to understand that, I'd like to look at the electron configuration of the Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus ion. So we start with the Fe2 plus. And as I said, 2 plus is a very common oxidation state for the transition metals. Well, here's your iron here. So 2 plus it loses those two electrons. So we'll end up with the electron configuration looking something like that. For the Fe3 plus ion, however, it will have lost a third electron. And the extra one that we've lost would have been this one here. So we end up with this electron configuration. And because this has got a half filled 3D orbital, this gives this electron arrangement extra stability, as we've seen before uh, when looking at ionisation energies. So sometimes by looking at the electron configuration of the transition metals, we can predict what arrangement is going to be the most stable and it normally would be something to do with having full or half full uh, electron orbitals. So by now you should be able to work out the oxidation number of an element in both simple compounds and in polyatomic species. You should be able to recognise oxidation and reduction reactions by the change in the oxidation number of a species and thirdly you should understand that transition metals can often exist in a range of oxidation states and can comment on their relative stability.